Before his book Healing Words was published in 1993, only three U.S. medical schools had courses devoted to exploring the role of religious practice and prayer to health. Currently, nearly 80 medical schools have instituted such courses, many of which utilize Dr. Dossi's works as their textbooks. In his 1989 book, Recovering the Soul, he introduced the concept of non-local mind, mind uncon unconfined to the brain and body, mind spread infinitely throughout space and time. Since then, non-local mind has been adopted by many leading scientists as an emerging image of consciousness. Dr. Dossi's ever-deepening explication of non-local mind provides a legitimate foundation for the merging of spirit and medicine. The ramifications of such a union are radical and call for no less than the reinvention of medicine. Tonight, Dr. Larry Dossi will take us on a poetic, well-researched journey into the many paradoxes that are inherent in the human condition and how they relate to healing the body, the mind, and the soul. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Larry Dossi. Thanks, Cody. Uh, I got to say it's great to be back in uh, foggy, I mean sunny Southern California. Uh, I want to express my appreciation first for the honor, Cody and Robin, uh, being included in this conference. You guys have put together one of the greatest series of conferences currently operating in the United States. This is a health conference. And just for the health of it, I want to make some observations about my own profession to start with. These may sound critical, and they are. I reserve the right to criticize my own profession. And I happen to believe that if we do not do that, we're going to be in worse shape down the line than we are today. Yes. So if you will permit me to point out some problems that we have currently, uh, this should be of interest to everyone here because whether you want to or not, you're subject to the uh, impact of these problems. One problem we have in this business is complexity. This is an average operating suite in any major hospital in the country. And just looking at this, you might, may say, well, how can all of these players keep it all straight? The short answer is they can't. And if you look at the data now, you see complexity coming out uh, in terms of drug interactions, which no one can any longer keep straight, the side effects of medications, and the plain old everyday errors and mistakes that healthcare professionals make when you check into a hospital. Some authorities now say that hospital care has become the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. Because of deaths due to medical errors and mistakes and the side effects of drugs that are administered to you when you check in. I'm not making this up. This data came out of the Journal of the American Medical Association just a few years back. Now, uh, here's another scene in a, uh, an intensive care unit, uh, which would be an average scene in any hospital. Uh, there's a body back there. Uh, you might be able to see the head just sort of peeking through the monitors. How could this nurse keep all of this straight? The short answer again is she can't. This is one patient's IVs. Uh, this is a blizzard of intravenous infusions. How can this nurse keep it straight? She can do her best, uh, but it's not always good enough. Another problem is simply the expense. 
I don't know if you saw the uh, lead article which brought this to the national attention last year. It came out of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, medical bills and illnesses are a major cause of more than half of all the personal bankruptcies filed in the United States every year. And it's been said that these are just problems for low-income people. That's wrong. The survey found that the bankruptcies occurred mostly in middle-class families, in families with college education, and often in families who have health insurance, but the insurance doesn't pay, or it pays suboptimally. I'll get this straight in just a second here. Another problem is the effectiveness of modern medicine. Consider life expectancy. The top of that curve has flattened. This is a national shame. Our country ranks currently 29th in the world behind countries such as Costa Rica in life expectancy. Consider infant mortality. We now rank 36th in the world, although we spend three times more than the nearest uh, country in health care. We rank uh, behind countries like Cuba, Aruba, and Slovenia in infant mortality. Another problem is the applicability of modern medicine. Surveys show that three-fourths of the people who go to doctors have nothing physically wrong with them. This means, largely, that those people who go to those physicians are beyond what the reach of modern medicine has to offer. And so, let me just ask you a duh question here. <laughs> just imagine, could there be simpler, safer, more applicable, more effective, and maybe less costly approaches to health care? I think the answer to this question is yes, and the book that Cody generously referred to is a book I have written which explores uh, other options, The Extraordinary Healing Power of Ordinary Things. Now let me just, before I go any further, provide a, just a quick explanation for the, I, how I got interested uh, in this uh, line of thinking. It had to do with an experience I had when I was in college as a, as a senior at the University of Texas in Austin. I was finishing up my pre-med work and finishing uh, my work uh, in uh, getting a degree in pharmacy, and I came down with acute appendicitis. Uh, like any good student uh, on campus, I went over to the, uh, the, <laughs> the campus health center. I wound up getting an acute, uh, uh, an operation for acute appendicitis, and when I uh, came to, I was hurting like the devil, I was isolated, alone, uh, really frightened. Uh, none of my uh, friends were there. My parents didn't even know it was going on. I didn't have an opportunity to, to meet the surgeon ahead of time. He thought it was not necessary. I didn't e even have a chance to uh, meet the anesthesiologist ahead of time. And so I was a mess when I came to from anesthesia. And something remarkable happened. A nurse came by, and she didn't say much at all. She just held my hand, and something dramatic took place. All those things that were troubling me just went away. It was as if somebody had turned a switch. The anxiety, the tension, the pain, the fear just simply disappeared. I didn't know such a thing was possible. At that time in my life, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as a mind-body interaction. I'd never heard of the word healing in pre-med. Uh, I didn't know that people's <laughs> intentions could make a difference. I didn't know that prayers worked. But seared into my mind after that moment was an appreciation for things that are really simple, that can make a huge difference in our health. And I've been hooked on the power of ordinary things to make a difference ever since. Having mentioned nurses, let me kind of enlarge in my uh, homage to the profession. Nursing is consistently rated the most honest and ethical profession in the United States. Uh, I don't know if you all saw the Gallup poll December of 2004, but it was a repeat of polls every year since, uh, before that. Nurses were given a 79% approval rating where ethics and honesty are concerned. I've highlighted a few of the other professions just for your information. Doctors came in fourth. Uh, TV reporters and newspaper journalists came in way down the line at 23 and 21 percent. Lawyers came in at 18 percent. And congressmen 
nudged out car salesman by 10 to 9. <laughs> so I'm sure that there must be some nurses here, and I just want to offer my appreciation as somebody who has who has stood in the trenches with nurses for decades. And if nurses disappeared, our healthcare system would have to shut down, folks. It would not operate. It could not operate. So thank you, nurses. The secret of life is inside the heart. Why do you suppose it was hidden there? Because it's the one place nobody ever looks. <laughs> this cartoon always reminds me of a folk saying that makes the similar kind of message. If you want to hide the treasure, put it in plain sight. And then nobody will see it. So I want to focus on some treasures in plain sight, which are the, cha uh, the chapters in the book. Uh, here are those chapters. I'll focus mostly on optimism, the healing power of optimism tonight. But also in the book, uh, I focus on the value, the health value of forgetting, on novelty, on crying, tears, dirt, as in, yes, getting dirty, <laughs> on music, on taking risks, plants and bugs, they're back in medicine, big time, by the way. The value of unhappiness. The value not of doing something, but of doing nothing. The value of voices. I mean, as in hearing voices. The value of mystery and the value of miracles. So let's focus on optimism. You know, optimism has to do with whether or not you see the, the glass is half empty or half full, right? Uh, optimism is the belief or the expectation that things are just going to turn out well in any given situation. People who take that view see the glass is half full. And pessimism, on the other hand, is the belief or expectation that things are just going to turn out badly, seeing the glass is half empty. Uh, when pessimists see something like this, they usually see a sunset, not a sunrise. The sunsets and sunrises are kind of like a Rorschach test for pessimism and optimism. Uh, so what do you think those were? They, they were all sunrises, by the way. So the question then becomes, why do some people always see sunsets, or why do they always see the glasses half empty? This question actually fascinates me. And in the last few years, uh, uh, social anthropologists and bio evolutionary biologists have come up with a case for pessimism. And here's the way this uh, reasoning works. In our evolutionary history, those people who were really pessimistic were the people who were just really cautious all the time. They didn't take a lot of chances. And so because they were cautious and pessimistic thinking the worst thing could happen, they had a better survival rate than optimists who just didn't follow all of those precautions out of fear and so on. They held back. So the thinking of the evolutionary biologist is then that pessimism wound up having survival value. And so it was likely to be genetically uh, passed from generation for generation. Now this is the best I'm going to be able to do tonight defending pessimism. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, uh, Churchill said, the optimist sees opportunity in every danger, while the pessimist sees danger in every opportunity. <laughs> A pessimist asks you if there's milk in the pitcher. An optimist just asks you to pass the cream. <laughs> you know, when life hands you lemons, uh, you just make lemonade if you're an optimist. It's all for the best. I needed, needed a new car anyway. I mean, you just can't get an optimist down, a thoroughgoing optimist. Here's optimism for you. Somebody will come. <laughs> you 
Here's optimism, lost in space. This is the optimistic astronaut. Someone will come. <clears throat> oh, pessimists, uh, man, oh, man. Pessimists say, this won't change until hell freezes over. Right? You ever heard a pessimist say something like that? Whereas the optimist comes right back and says, hell has already frozen over. Let's get on with it. Uh, th this uh, image of hell having frozen over uh, is a roadside, road, road sign outside of the little town of Hale, Michigan. Has anybody ever been to Hale, Michigan? Well, if you want to go, uh, and actually I think it, it would be neat if you were able to tell your friends, I've been to Hale and back. Uh, it's between, it's where the Red Star is. It's between Lansing and Detroit if you want to go to hell. Uh, a pessimist says something like this. Not until pigs fly. Right? That's the current end thing. The optimist says, they're already flying. Let's just get on with things. I guess this has become the most popular expression of uh, thoroughgoing optimism in the culture in the past few years. Uh, the uh, phrase from the 89 movie Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come, right? And we built a country once and people did come. I mean, there's a lot to say for this. It's written into our national history. But pessimists just can't go along with something that obvious. Uh, if you build it, you know, we'll, can we be sure they will come? I mean, if you look at the ballpark, there are a lot of seats filled here in the foreground, but out in the bleachers, there are a lot of empty seats, so you just can't be too optimistic about these things. And pessimists always have a way of coming up with some counter evidence to sandbag your position as an optimist. For example, here's full-blown pessimism. Even if you do build it, they will not come. They'll point out something like the old 57 Edsel and say, well, Ford built it, nobody bought it. You know, that blows your argument. They neglect to point out that the Edsel was one of the worst cars the American auto industry ever came up with. You all have heard of the pessimistic chickens, haven't you? <laughs> I mean, they're always having these discussions. Uh, I, bet, I bet you think this glass is half empty, don't you? No, it, it's half full, but I bet there's arsenic in it. Yeah. So I got to tell you, uh, don't waste your time. Uh, w one of the most fruitless endeavors in all of life is arguing with pessimists. Uh, Am Ambrose Bierce, the American author, was one of the most pessimistic men of American literature. He said that pessimists see the world aright. And they are convinced of this, and they have endless evidence to prove that you're wrong and they're correct. So, unless you just have something better to do, don't waste your time arguing with pessimists because I'm telling you, it really is a dead end. Now, if there are any pessimists here, and you're feeling really alone, you need to check out the Life Sucks Club. Here's the website. Uh, angelfire.com slash ca slash slash life sucks club slash this is a watering hole for pessimists pessimism like misery does love love company so if you're feeling isolated as a pessimist you know you really don't have to be you can ch sort of congregate with people of your own uh, attitude here's some famous pessimists who uh, uh, are often quoted the American author Paul Fussell says, I find nothing more depressing than optimism. Uh, the, uh, the philosopher Oswald Spengler, optimism is cowardice. Havelock Ellis, the English author and philosopher, the place where optimism most flourishes is the lunatic asylum. <laughs> Sir Peter Ustinov, the point of living and of being an optimist is to be foolish enough to believe the best is yet to come. So, look at it this way. If you really work at it, you can find an infinite number of reasons to be a pessimist or an optimist. So, you might as well be an optimist because it takes about the same amount of energy. I line up with Winston Churchill on this point. For myself, I'm an optimist. It does not seem to be much use 
being anything else. <laughs> so <clears throat> I spend sometimes wondering how pessimists get that way. Uh, I've already given you the genetic, evolutionary, biological explanation. <laughs> Albert Hubbard was an American author uh, and uh, philosopher. He died in 1915. That was the year that Germany sank the Lusitania, the cruise ship. Hubbard and his wife were on the Lusitania. He had reason to be a pessimist, I guess. But in any case, he said, a pessimist is a man who has been compelled to live with an optimist. Here are the optimistic sharks <laughs> watching the Titanic. <laughs> this pessimism and optimism stuff can be relative. I'd be the first to admit that. I just love happy endings. One thing that's fascinating about pessimism is if you carry it to serious extremes, it can do a flip and actually become funny. Uh, for example, some wag in medicine said, life is a sexually transmitted disease with 100% mortality. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of hard to argue with the facts of it, but I mean, why, why would you want to take that particular point of view? Uh, there's a third-year medical student who's become quite famous for saying this, a healthy person is someone who has not been completely worked up. <laughs> I mean, the facts speak for themselves. I mean, I think this could be true. I mean, if you do enough tests on anybody, sooner or later, something's going to turn up. It may be even a lab error, which we were talking about, but, you know, the medical student could be right. Who knows? But this is sort of what we mean by gallows humor, this pessimism flip. This is where people say that things are so bad, I just might as well laugh. And there have been American comedians who have made a career out of this. Rodney Dangerfield is one of my favorites. You know, I get no respect. Uh, as you can see from the dates, Rodney died a couple of years ago. And I thought you might want to see what happened when he went to heaven and was sitting with St. Peter on the cloud looking down at his gravesite, St. Peter says, so much for your I don't get no respect routine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Woody Allen's maybe our greatest pessimistic comedian. More than any other time in history, he says, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other path leads to total extinction. <laughs> Let us pray that we have the wisdom to choose correctly. <laughs> Many of you all know Kay Redfield Jamison's fabulous book, An Unquiet Mind, which she wrote several years ago about her bipolar disorder. She's a great uh, psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School. She's written a recent book called Exuberance. This is about people who are over the top with optimism. I mean, these are not just optimistic people. You know, these are these people that really are kind of hard to be around sometimes. As a matter of fact, she says about exuberant people, we like being around them, enjoy the energy and enthusiasm, but it's kind of exhausting. Uh, here's a book that uh, takes a sort of the same position, Irrational Exuberance, written by Yale's uh, Robert Schiller. This is a book about how over-the-top optimism uh, in the economy leads to boom and bust cycles, sort of like the dot-com crash when everybody really got exuberant. So I guess it's sort of Yale against uh, print, uh, Harvard, but here's a Harvard uh, economist who wrote a book called Rational Exuberance, Silencing the Enemies of Growth. Michael Mandel uh, wrote the book about how optimism about high-tech breakthroughs can actually fuel the U.S. economy. Here's an example of optimism just raging out of control. And in the blue corner, taking optimism way too far. How many people have met the optimistic? Uh, she's just so encouraging. 
I see troubles in your future, but don't worry, you'll get past them. I see losses, but so many good things too. Everything will turn out just fine. That's the optimistic. So why are we talking about this uh, optimism stuff uh, at a uh, health conference? What justification is there at a health conference for even putting this on the table? Well, folks, I think uh, this is a no-brainer. Uh, let me give you the bottom line first. In general, optimists simply live longer than do pessimists, and they have a lower incidence of every major disease you want to look at. Now, if that's not enough to make someone perk up, I don't know what it would take. Uh, so you can see some of the health behaviors that pessimists fall into, and you might be able to see that optimists have a pretty good reason for being healthier and living longer than pessimists. Optimists are more likely to do something like this. Uh, while pessimists are <laughs> more likely to do something like this. This is a, an Olympic level, world class pessimist with a TV remote uh, there in hand and uh, old food on the floor. So how is it that optimism turns out to promote health? Well, optimists have a sense of personal efficacy. They believe that their choices can actually make a difference in life. And because they believe that, they're more inclined to act in ways that actually promote good health in contrast with pessimists who tend to take the point of view, there's nothing that I can do that's going to make much of a difference anyway, so why bother? Also, it's just the fact that optimists tend to be more lovable and easier to be around than pessimists. And because they are, they enjoy richer social networks which promote good health. I do not know anyone in medicine who's well informed these days who argues with this. The richer your social connections and your networking, the longer and healthier your life is going to be, statistically speaking. Also, Recent research has shown that the immune system tends to be more robust in optimists than in pessimists. Research shows that the cardiovascular system is more stable. And research shows that optimists in general have a lower level of stress hormones in the blood, such as cortisol and adrenaline. And here's a big one. Optimists tend to be depressed less easily. And when they get depressed, they don't spend as much time being depressed. And research indicates very compellingly that depression is strongly correlated with one heck of a lot of health problems. And here's something that absolutely fascinates me. The mere fact of an optimistic attitude helps predict from right now forward how long you're going to live. Let me enlarge on that for you. Let me ask you a question. If, if you wanted to predict whether or not you were going to be alive 10 years from right now, how would you go about doing that? If you think like an internist or a family physician or somebody who asked this question for a living, here's what uh, you would want to know. You would want to know what this person's past medical history was. Was this person healthy or not? Spent a lot of time in the hospital and so on. You'd want to know something like that. You would also want to know something about the genetics involved. What's the family history? You would do, do a physical examination right now, and you would plug this person into various lab tests and x-rays and scans, and you would crunch all of those numbers and massage all that data, and then you would make a prediction about whether or not you were going to be alive 10 years from today. Research in upwards of 70 studies now, taking into account tens of thousands of people of both sexes from age 10 to 90, shows that none of those things are the best predictor of longevity. None of them. The best predictor is the answer that people give to a simple question. What do you happen to think about your health? Are you optimistic about your health or not? This outperforms any of the other things that we know about in making that prediction. And so basically these studies inquire about whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about your health right now. 
Uh, this is a, a question that always brings up the, the skeptics and they say, well, it's the chicken and the egg problem. Are people optimistic because they're healthy or are they healthy because they're optimistic? The evidence is compelling that this goes back and forth in both directions and that this is not an either or but a both and kind of situation. And here is the woman who put this field on the map. Ellen Adler did this work uh, back in the 80s uh, at uh, Yale Medical School at the time. And uh, this is the paper in the Journal of Gerontology which was covered in the New York Times science section that really brought this to national attention. And if you fast forward uh, to 97, by that time there were 27 of these studies. And if you fast forward to right now, as I mentioned, we're over 70 of these studies and they all show the same thing. Whether or not you're optimistic about your health is the best predictor of how long you're going you're to live. So what do you think about your health? Uh, this is not a trivial question anymore. This is the question that the researchers all ask in these studies. It's the same question in every study. Is your health good, fair, or poor? And if you say that your health is just fair or poor, you better think about feeding your optimism. How would you generate more optimism? Well, the first step is just simply to get out of the habit of thinking that optimism is just a feeling. It's just something that floats around in my head north of my clavicles. That is a, a very shallow, trivial, and an erroneous attitude toward what optimism is. Optimism is a powerful force. It penetrates every cell and organ in your body. Now, let's ask why it is that uh, people's health perceptions of, uh, of, of where they stand outperform physical exams. Well, physical exams are just that. They're, ju they're just physical. Uh, they neglect the mind and the spirit. Another reason why people's perceptions of their own health may be excellent predictors of longevity is that people may be able in their own sensitivities and feelings of taking more factors into consideration than do static physical exams and laboratory tests which just take a little snapshot of where you are at one given point in time. This is a way of saying that people may be more sensitive to the dynamic changes that go on from moment to moment, week to week, year to year, than is obvious through physical exams and lab tests and so on. Another reason why what you think may influence tremendously how long you live and how healthy you are is that we may internalize those beliefs and live them out, whether or not they're pessimistic or optimistic. And also, and I hope this doesn't cause people too much intellectual indigestion here, people may be able to see the future. They may be able to see the outcome of their health down the line and reflect that outcome and the answer they give in the present about how healthy they are. And so there is compelling evidence that the future may actually influence the present and that the present may influence the past and what we are beginning to call non-local or trans-temporal information exchange. So if this is too rich for you and causes you any trouble, I suggest that we have come to a point where we are just going to have to take a deep breath and suck it up <laughs> and get used to this because the data is not going to go away and it's becoming more and more abundant that this is the way information flow happens in the world. Dr. Dean Radin at the Institute of Noetic Sciences is, is one of the leading investigators of these kinds of experiments. Uh, and uh, he has replicated his own studies. Other laboratories throughout Western Europe and the United States have represented, uh, replicated this uh, information also. Uh, Dr. William Broad, who is Director of Research at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, reviewed 23 of these uh, uh, experiments and found that people are able to reach back into the past with their intentions in certain situations and influence a health relevant event in the past even though that event lies in the past and is presumed already to have taken place. And what do you think about that? Don't answer that. Uh,
Dr. Brian Olshansky, who is a uh, colleague of mine at the uh, University of Iowa School of Medicine, he's a cardiologist, is at the peak of his profession. Uh, he and I stirred this uh, pot uh, back uh, three years ago by publishing an article in the British Medical Journal on uh, retroactive prayer. Uh, we contend that people can pray about things that have presumably happened and under the right conditions, under the right circumstances. Prayer can shape the outcome of the past. Uh, we base this on a positive retroactive prayer study in which thousands of patients who had been hospitalized four to ten years earlier with a uniform condition, which was sepsis, which is bloodstream poisoning, were prayed for in the present. Half were, half weren't. Those who were prayed for had a superior clinical course compared to the people who were in the control group who were not offered prayer in the present. We're going to have to get used to this one. For my part, I love it. Optimism really got a uh, lift back in the early 80s when Suzanne Cabasa, who was a social psychologist at the University of Chicago, studied a bunch of people who were in a work situation that was incredibly stressful. Imagine the worst you've ever heard of. This was probably it. This work situation was so bad that the company had installed a coronary care unit in the building. <laughs> so people didn't have to go very far when they had their heart attack on the job. <laughs> and, and they, honest, so th th they found out that uh, some of these people who worked in the same environment just never got sick, though. They really stood out. They seemed to thrive on the stress. They never became ill. Uh, this was in contrast to other people who just got stressed out and had heart attacks and ulcers and high blood pressure and required immense uh, expenditures in health care. And so what was the difference? They found out that the people who never got sick, although they were stressed, had what they call the three C's, or psychological hardiness. Control, commitment, and challenge. They had a sense of control. In other words, they believed that they could influence future health outcomes. They had a sense of commitment, not just to their job, which they did, but also a sense of purpose and commitment to their family, to their community, and to their nation. And they also had a sense of challenge. They loved taking on tough tasks, and they were open to new experiences. Here's a multitasking mother. I don't know how mothers manage to do this without going under, but they do. And so Kabasa and her colleagues boiled all of this data down, and they came up with one key concept, which they thought captured better than any other what was going on here. And this was a sense of optimistic appraisal of any given situation. That's opposed to the pessimistic appraisal like this. Nah, it can't be just that the plug's out. That would be too simple and inexpensive. Now let me emphasize once again that this business about optimism and pessimism are not, not just emotions or feelings that float around in your brain. They do influence probably every organ in your body. My friend, Dr. Daniel Mark at Duke School of Medicine, followed 1,700 men and women after they had a cardiac cath. And he found that after one year, if people were pessimistic, 12% of them died. But if they were optimistic, only 5% died. This was uh, confirmed by Dr. Nancy Frazier Smith at the Montreal Heart Institute. She followed uh, heart patients over 18 months and if people scored high on pessimism, they were eight times more likely to die than people who were optimistic. I'm telling you, these things are not just feelings that float around in your head. You know, sometimes the value of something is most obvious when it's totally taken away. And then you can see if it was important or not. Uh, I think this is most obvious in our culture during grief and bereavement. Some of you all will be familiar with the uh, Holmes Ray Life Stress Inventory. This is a rating scale for, uh, 
of all, many different events in life as to how much stress they cause us. They list right at the top grief and bereavement as the most stressful event humans can endure. So what happens during that? Well, during the first 12 months following the death of a spouse, the surviving spouse has a risk of death that is 10 times higher than what it is for the average aged matched married population. Uh, this has been uh, consistent in just about every study that's been done in the Western world. Uh, back when I was practicing internal medicine, when one of my patients had a spouse to die, I would tell him or her, over the next year, I want to see you once a month, whether you think you're healthy or not. We need to talk about this. I need to see you. I want to check you. I think uh, to do otherwise is probably unethical. We know something about how this works. The immune system shuts down in the surviving spouse during grief and bereavement. And even when the lymphocytes, the immune cells, were taken out of the blood of the surviving spouse and put in test tubes and exposed to chemicals that ordinarily turned them on immediately, they wouldn't do anything. You could not even flog these immune cells into working. So it is no uh, mystery, I think, whether uh, as to why surviving spouses have a higher instance of uh, serious infection and cancer during the first year of bereavement. And you can do something about this. This is so simple. Recent work shows that if you bring uh, the surviving partners who are HIV positive, whose AIDS partner has just died, if you bring the surviving partner in to a bereavement counseling group, you can actually show that the viral concentration in the blood goes down as you do bereavement counseling on these people. Here is one of the most profound expressions of optimism in medicine, the old placebo response. This accounts for about 30 to 50 percent of our responses to all medications practically and up to 100 percent of our responses to certain surgical procedures. And the foundation of the placebo response is your idea that when you take this pill, something good is going to happen. Optimism lies at the heart of the placebo response. Uh, here's a doctor in a high-tech medical environment. He says, uh, th this is all just a front. Actually, I'm a faith healer. And, and if truth be told, so are we all. We're all faith healers in this business because of the pervasiveness of the placebo response. Then there's the nocebo response. It's the opposite of the placebo response. It's the belief that when you take a pill, something bad's going to happen. No good's going to come of this. And that's what happens. And so the foundation of the nocebo response is pessimism. Your certainty that this thing is not going to work. Here's another duh question for you. If optimism is good for your health, and if pessimism is not so good for your health, which should we be promoting in medicine? <laughs> I'll give you a while to think about that. Well, you'd think we're promoting pessimism from the way we behave sometimes. Dr. Bernard Lown, who wrote a book, he's a, he's a famous Harvard cardiologist, about what he called words that maim. You know, you've heard these things. Uh, doctor says to a patient, you're going downhill fast. You are living on borrowed time. You are a walking time bomb. There's nothing more I can do for you. Uh, these function like hexes and and curses uh, and spells. I, I wrote a book uh, about this. Once a book called Be Careful What You Pray For, You Just Might Get It. This book got me into more trouble than anything I have ever written because people just don't like to acknowledge the, uh, that this, there's this side of, uh, of uh, intentions and, uh, and prayers and so on. So, if you, you know the expression hanging crepe in medicine? Doctors use this... Uh, all the time about each other. You know, this doctor hangs crepe. What they're talking about is like black crepe at a funeral. He's always predicting the worst to a patient. And so the doctor always comes out the winner in these kind of deals. 
because if he predicts the worst and it happens, he's wise. And if he predicts that something bad's going to happen and it doesn't happen, he's a hero. So he can't lose. So a lot of doctors slip into this. Andy, uh, Andrew Weil, some of you all may have heard him talk about a patient of his uh, who went to see a, another doctor earlier and was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She had a normal examination. She had almost no symptoms, but in spite of this, the doctor went out of the office, went and got a wheelchair, came back into the office, and told her to get up out of her chair and sit in a wheelchair. She said, why should I do that? He said, I want you to make friends with your wheelchair for when you really need it. And he said, I want you, when you leave my office, you go by the store and you buy your own wheelchair and you practice sitting in it one hour a day <laughs> so you will know how to befriend it and feel at one with your wheelchair when you really do uh, move into the ravages of, of multiple sclerosis. Some of these things would be actually funny if they weren't so serious. So I've often wondered if we're looking at the death of optimism uh, in medicine. And uh, the question is, can, can optimism in this profession, the healing profession, be resuscitated? Can we teach young medical students to be optimistic toward their patients and to convey hope? Uh, that's an important question, but let me tell you an even more important question than that. Can doctors learn to convey optimism and hope to themselves? This is a serious issue in the United States. I don't know if you're familiar with the suicide rates in doctors. They're atrocious. Uh, male physicians kill themselves 1.41 times more frequently than males in the general population. With women doctors, it's awful. Women physicians kill themselves 2.27 times more frequently than women in the general population. So, can we learn optimism? Or when we're born, is our temperament already factory installed? Does it come as original e equipment? Can you learn to modify it, shape it, or change it? Or is it hardwired in the brain? Uh, Cody mentioned Joan Borshenko uh, earlier. Joan has combed this country for nearly 20 years talking about spiritual optimism and the fact that it can be cultivated. So uh, I think her book, Fire in the Soul, A New Psychology of Spiritual Optimism, is one of the best out there. In case you want to read about spiritual optimism, what about other kinds? The leading character in the landscape now in this area is Martin Seligman, who's the former president of the American Psychological Association. Marty says it's just as easy as ABC to learn how to be optimistic. And so here's the best-selling book on this uh, subject, Learned Optimism, How to Change Your Mind and Your Life. So here are Marty's uh, ABCs and a D and an E. We don't have time to go into this, but basically this is a way of what psychologists call reframing an issue in your life. You kind of think of the issue that you want to, say, convert from a pessimistic uh, response to an optimistic one, and you dialogue with yourself, you go through the steps, and come out with a learned way of the next time it happens of responding not pessimistically but optimistically. Pessimists hate this stuff because they consider it gimmicky. You know, you're just trying to psychologize me. You know, they think you're trying to change them. You know, as we've already said, as uh, Ambrose Beer said, they are convinced already they see the world aright. But if you can capture pessimists and get them to sit down and go through these things, you can see that they actually work. These methods have been tried in children, uh, college students, and adults. And here's what's really uh, fascinating, I think. If you measure like changes in the immune system before and after people take these courses, you can see that positive changes occur in the immune system as people learn to do this. Let me mention my all-time favorite 
psychology clinical study. I call it the potted plant experiment. And it has to do with optimism. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, two social psychologists, Ellen Langer and Judith Roden, got interested in this. And so they went into a very large nursing home. And they divided these hundreds of nursing home residents into two parts. One, they gave, one half they gave a little potted plant to. I mean, this was little more than just a sprig of ivy. I don't know how much it cost to get a sprig of ivy in a plastic pot in 1976, but it was probably under 50 cents. And so here's what they told these people who got the potted plants. Look, here's your plant, and if this sucker lives or die, dies, it's going to be because what you did to it. This is your responsibility. But you know what? You can do this. So they really hyped up these, these older people with the potted plant. You are up to this. We know you can uh, take care of this plant and it's going to thrive. Now the other uh, half uh, were just simply told, well, you know, there's a little experiment going on and you're not getting the plants, but don't worry, we're just going to take care of you like we've always done here at the nursing home. Plan your meals, clean your room, so, you know, not to worry, and so on. Here's what happened. After only three weeks, this optimistic, I can do this group with the plan began to get healthier. They stopped going to the health clinic so often. They started participating more in group activities. And by 18 months, get this, the death rate in the potted plant group had fallen by 50%. I don't know anything you can do in a nursing home to bring down the death rate by 50%. You talk about a bang for your buck. How much does a little sprig of ivy cost uh, these days? Not a whole heck of a lot. You know, last night about midnight, I got a call in the hotel here from a friend of mine who said, uh, my 91-year-old mother uh, is not doing well, and, uh, you know, she just kind of got the dwindles. Do you have any suggestions about what I might do to perk her up? And uh, she had had, uh, she had actually been uh, run over by an automobile. And so we talked about this, that, and the other. And then, after we'd had our conversation and he hung up, I realized, to my dismay, that I had forgot to tell him to get her a sprig of ivy. And I could just kick myself for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recall him back. <laughs> let, me, let me change directions here. And speak more broadly about the effects of optimism. I am convinced that optimism affects not just our personal health, our individual health, but the collective health uh, of the community and the nation, and even including the health of the entire planet, which makes this issue of optimism more uh, important uh, than anything I can think of. Now, I believe that there's something epidemic in our world, in our country, which I want to call theological pessimism. And this is a destructive worldview that is based on the literal interpretation of sacred books and sacred texts, and in which I would include the, the Quran as well as the Bible, but because I grew up in Christianity, because Christianity is the dominant theme, uh, dominant religion in our country, I'm going to confine my remarks to Christianity. There are four doctrines, concepts in Christianity that are profoundly pessimistic. Let me run through them. These are my four, my top four. One is the apocalypse. This is the total destruction of evil and the total triumph of good as prophesied in the book of Revelation. Next on my list is the rapture. 
This is the second coming of Jesus Christ when true believers are predicted to rise up in the air to meet Jesus Christ while the unbelievers are left behind and are eventually consigned to hell forever. Now, if you're one of the risers, you know, th this is not a pessimistic deal. I mean, that's, that's optimism. <laughs> well, I don't know how you line up on this, but something tells me that the vast majority of people in this room are not going to be rising. <laughs> this has led to all sorts of bumper stickers in Santa Fe, where, where we live. Uh, uh, you know, in case of rapture, can I have your Cadillac? Uh, that, that's kind of thing. <laughs> I consider this profoundly pessimistic theologically, damnation. This is condemnation to eternal punishment in hell. And the last one I put on the list is Armageddon. And Armageddon is the battle between the forces of good and evil that is predicted to mark the end of the world and precede the day of judgment as described in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation. Now. If you boil all that down, here's the situation. <laughs> it is only a matter of time until the entire world and most of humanity, not only just humanity that is living today, but who has ever lived, goes to hell in a handbasket. Now, as I've already mentioned, if you're saved or you're one of the elect, this outcome is really not pessimistic. This is wonderful. It's wonderfully optimistic. But I ask you, how is it that a theology that yearns for a fiery end of the earth and that accepts the eternal agony of most humans who have ever lived be considered optimistic by any humane standard? How is that? You may think that this is a gross exaggeration, and I'm going off on a tangent here, but let me remind you of some facts. 55% of Americans believe in the rapture. Uh, this was a Newsweek poll uh, of, uh, uh, recently as May of, uh, of last year. 36% believe that the book of Revelation is true and literal prophecy. 74% of us in this country believe in Satan. 68% believe in hell. And only 28% believe in evolution. I'm sure that many of you know the Left Behind series of books. This is the biggest publishing blockbuster of the last decade. It sold 62 million copies uh, in, and counting. These are techno thrillers about the end of the world. And these books have outsold Stephen King and John Grisham and Larry Dossey combined. Now, you, you may want to prepare. If you do, here's a website. It's the Rapture Ready website. You can check it out. It's raptureready.com. You can read about the Rapture Dialogues on the website. And you can also tap into the link for the Rapture Index at this website. Now, the Rapture Index is a way of predicting the likelihood of the Rapture. And it assigns a numerical value to a great many world events that are happening these days. And if you go over 145, that means the rapture is right here. Well, the value in January of 2005, last year was 151, so you may want to buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> I happen to not be joking about uh, this. I think that people's religious pessimism influences their behaviors and actions toward other people and the world. And I think this has profound consequences for the health of both. And this is why I think it's justified in talking about this at a health conference. For example, there are a lot of people out there who believe, they're convinced, that if Jesus is coming back right away, we cannot possibly run out of natural resources. So why conserve or protect anything? Bill Moyers, this past year, got into real trouble making this point. Uh, 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 to the religious right. And I don't know why this is, 
But these views about rapture, apocalypse, Armageddon, and damnation go hand in hand with the desire of people on the religious right to control the health freedoms of everybody else. And if you can figure this out, I wish you would explain this for me, to me. Some of you may have read this week uh, uh, about uh, or an article in the Washington Post which describes that the religious right now has dozens of bills before 18 state legislatures that would permit health workers of every conceivable type, not just doctors, nurses, and pharmacists, but also aides and technicians and anybody else who works in the health environment, not to treat patients if they object to any therapy being given that patient, whatever, on any religious ground, whatever. Now, if this doesn't scare you, you need to rethink. Any treatment could be denied to gays, lesbians, or anybody else that this individual considers morally objectionable. These people have, by just deciding not to do something, can neutralize all end-of-life planning. They can disregard do-not-resuscitate orders. And they could refuse to fill prescriptions for birth control pills, do lab tests that are connected with in vitro fertilization. They could stall all stem cell procedures, genetic testing of embryos, or anything else that happened to violate this health worker's sense of conscience. If this isn't enough to trouble you, maybe this will. Several of these bills would permit insurance companies to deny coverage for services that they consider objectionable for religious reasons. I think it's quite ironic to even suggest in the first place that insurance companies have a conscience. <laughs> so what this boils down to, folks, is that the health freedoms of everybody in this room, the majority of people in America, could be held hostage to the religious whims of the tiniest majority. I think it's fair to ask uh, how Christian are these literal apocalyptic interpretations of the fate of the earth? Uh, one of my uh, favorite theologians writing these days is Karen Armstrong. And in her fabulous book, A History of God, uh, she points out that this obsession with a literal interpretation of the Bible didn't even come into existence until the 16th century. This is fairly recent stuff. And if you go back, you can find that some of the fabulous church fathers, such as Augustine and Aquinas, didn't do literal interpretations. They preferred allegorical or symbolic interpretations. Uh, there has been a long flirtation of politics in our country with this apocalyptic, pessimistic theological point of view. Uh, this really got rolling during President Reagan's administration. We, he invited Hal Lindsey to come in and give a talk to, on nuclear war to strategists at the Pentagon. Lindsey is the guy who wrote one of the major apocalyptic blockbusters, The Late Great Planet Earth. It sold 15 million copies. Uh, this wasn't the only uh, indication of the flirtation of politics and this apocalyptic thinking. Uh, Reagan also invited Jerry Falwell to attend National Security Council briefings. You may think that this has died a death. <clears throat> Actually, it's just getting revved up. Many prominent members of con Congress now belong to something called the Council for National Policy. This is a secretive Christian pressure group which plots the strategy for the religious right in this country. It is profoundly apocalyptic, and it believes in a fiery, literal version of the end of everything. So what is what's the relevance of this? For the world. Well, Sam Harris uh, had a go at this in his recent book, The End of Faith. Uh, he says, millions of Christians and Muslims now organize their lives around prophetic traditions that will only find fulfillment once rivers of blood begin flowing from Jerusalem. It is not at all difficult to imagine how prophecies of internecine war, once taken seriously, could become self-fulfilling. So what's our challenge? 
Well, I think it's to prevent the religious certainty of this impending apocalyptic global catastrophe from, catastrophe, catastrophe from becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we need to figure out how to prevent it from blocking our very best efforts to build a better world. And our challenge is to honor the perennial admonitions of all the major religions simply to love thy neighbor as thyself. This injunction is not based on pessimism and apocalypse. It's based in optimism. And it's based in hope and love and compassion. So we better spend more time thinking about whether our future is going to be something like this or whether our future is going to be something like this. Theological pessimism converts people into an us-against-them contest based on whether you are saved or not. This is not exaggeration. This is a comment by Robert P. George, who is a famous Princeton theologian who currently sits on President George Bush's Council on Bioethics. And this is what Reverend George says about Christian doctrine currently. There is, I'm afraid, an us and a them. This is not Jerry Falwell talking. This is one of the hotshot theologians in the nation at the academic level. So you're either in the box or out of the box. Jonathan Swift got it right 300 years ago. We have just enough religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. Let me take you back to 9-11 and show you some of the consequences of this us-against-them thinking. You all will remember that in the days following 9-11, during the first week, a wave of religious bigotry swept over our country. That's not new and different, but it was really more sinister this time because it was marinated in patriotism. Uh, there, three days after 9-11, Reverend Falwell announced to the nation the reason for the tragedies. It was because God had lifted his protective shield from America because of the combined activities of the gays, the lesbians, the people for the American way, the ACLU, the pro-choice advocates, and that really sinister social group, the feminists. <laughs> Reverend Franklin Graham, who is Billy's son and successor, said this of Islam, I believe it's a very evil and wicked religion. Paul Weirich and William Land, two leading political conservatives, speaking of American Muslims, they should be encouraged to leave. They're a fifth column in this country. Ann Coulter got famous for this one. We should invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity. Actually, she was sort of prophetic. I didn't know Ann had ESP, but she's got two of the three, right? Uh, Reverend Jerry Vines, uh, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, the prophet Muhammad was a demon-obsessed pedophile. <laughs> Falwell got so much heat after his initial revelation to the country as to the reason for the tragedies that he sort of went underground, but he just couldn't keep it in. About a year later on 60 Minutes, he said the prophet of Muhammad, prophet Muhammad was a terrorist. About a year later, Pat Robertson said this, you say you're supposed to be nice to the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Methodists and this, that, and the other thing? Nonsense. I don't have to be nice to the spirit of the Antichrist. And then for, for those of you who are not in the know, the Antichrist is the worst thing you can be called. At the 92 Republican National Convention, Pat Feminism encouraged women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft. This could be the worst of all. Destroy capitalism and become lesbians. <laughs> uh, 
This is a rather unbelievable one that came out, uh, interestingly, in an interview with Molly Ivins in 92. Uh, just like what Nazi Germany did to the Jews, so liberal America is now doing to the evangelical Christians. It's happening all over again. It's the Democratic Congress, the liberal-based media, and the homosexuals who want to destroy the Christians. If you thought it was the other way around, you, you just <laughs> got it wrong. Wholesale abuse and discrimination and the worst bigotry directed toward any group in America today. More terrible than anything suffered by any minority in history. I don't know your take on this. This is mine. Reverend Sidney Smith, the English clergyman 300 years ago, never tried to reason the prejudice out of a man. It was not reasoned into him. <laughs> and cannot be reasoned out. <laughs> Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., Supreme Court Justice. The mind of a bigot is like the pupil of the eye. The more light you pour upon it, the more it will contract. So I seriously want to ask you whether or not we as a nation can re return to theological optimism. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I think a theological optimistic view would be one that's based in allegorical and metaphorical and symbolic interpretations of sacred books and not in literal interpretations. I think theological optimism says that the earth and all of its creatures are good and worth protecting and preserving. I think theological optimism says that we ought to figure out ways of behaving toward one another that are inclusive and not divisive. And I think theological optimism embodies peace on earth, goodwill toward men, all men and all women, and all races, and all religions. We've got examples. This is the Dalai Lama's comment, my religion is simple. My religion is kindness. Every time I hear this comment, I'm uh, reminded by uh, about uh, one of the great English writers of the 20th century, Aldous Huxley, when he was on his deathbed, he was surrounded by friends and loved ones, and they said, Aldous, do you have any advice for those of us who will stay behind? And he said, yes. He said, try to be a little kinder to one another. We can change this if we want to. We've got a lot of stuff to work from. Here are three of my favorite optimistic theologians who are in the center of this debate. Sally McFaig, Father Thomas Berry, and I've already mentioned Karen Armstrong. Here are a few of their titles. My point is that theological optimism is not far out New Age stuff. These are powerful theologians, influential theologians, who are writing about a theology that is compatible with ecology and with a positive future for the earth. Our challenge is to make this real. E pluribus unum, one out of many, one. It's the national motto on the great seal of the United States. We've forgotten something. Here's, relig here's religious and theological optimism for you. We are a nation of many nationalities, many races, many religions bound together by a single unity, the unity of freedom and equality. Whoever seeks to set one nationality against another seeks to degrade all nationalities. Whoever seeks to set one race against another seeks to enslave all races. Whoever seeks to set one religion against another seeks to destroy all religions. So let me ask you this in closing. How can we nourish optimism? Henry Dreher, a uh, New York writer, wrote a, one of the best books on mind-body interactions uh, ever a couple of years ago. Optimism is not just a psychological issue. Many people in our society, 
the chronically unemployed and the undereducated, the disaffected, the discriminated, or like those animals in psych lab experiments who can't turn off the shocks and who often just lie down and die. What's been called the no-exit syndrome. Henry continues, is it appropriate to expect these individuals to think themselves out of their plight through optimism? What he's asking is this. There has always been a kind of elitist connection to being optimistic because it's a lot easier to be optimistic if you're well-fed, clothed, sheltered, healthy, and employed. What if you're not? Do we have any business preaching the virtues of optimism to people who are disadvantaged? Jules Pfeiffer, the cartoonist, had a go at this. In one of his cartoons, the character is saying, I used to think I was poor. Then they told me I wasn't poor, I was needy. They told me it was self-defeating to think of myself as needy. I was deprived. Then they told me underprivileged was overused. I was disadvantaged. I still don't have a dime, but I've got a great vocabulary. <laughs> so our task is just not to preach to people to be optimistic. Our task is to help create the conditions in which optimism and hope can flower in the lives of every single one of our citizens. This optimism business is a collective endeavor. We have to help one another build optimism. We must make optimism and hope possible for everybody. No exceptions. Because when you get right down to it, we are all angels with only one wing. We can only fly while embracing one another. Here's a dilemma I want to close with. What can we do when optimism just doesn't seem to work anymore? When you cannot reason yourself into an optimistic response to a given situation. And if I had to pick an example right now, it might be global warming. Our government has reacted toward global warming, not with just ignoring it, but with actual contempt. And scholars now suggest that we may be either approaching a tipping point or actually having already passed it where we cannot go back. Uh, actually, uh, last week, uh, uh, James Lovelock, who invented the Gaia hypothesis, actually said in The Independent, which is one of the newspapers in the UK, that we have already gone past the tipping point. What do we do? when optimism just doesn't seem to be justified any longer. Well, I think something happens and something kicks in in our consciousness that isn't optimism. It's something more fundamental and basic. It's called hope. Václav Havel wrote about hope. Hope is a state of mind, not of the world. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same thing as joy that things are going well but rather an ability to work for something because it is inherently good, because it is the right thing to do. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something's going to turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Emily Dickinson wrote, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in, the, perches in the soul. So you may be able, we may be able to find optimism through our analysis and reason and logic and intellectuality. But if we're going to reach for hope, it is going to be in the deepest reaches of our being that we're going to have to go to, into the soul. Optimism is a warm-up for hope. Optimism is hope's training ground. Optimism is courageous, but hope is heroic. When optimism's back is to the wall, hope enters. Hope is the reserve battalion. It is what we say for the 11th hour, for the ninth inning, for overtime, because hope is life itself. 
And I would suggest to you that it is time for hope. Optimism, it's free, it consumes no natural resources, as far as we know it doesn't pollute, it's real good for your health and longevity, and optimism is an example of the extraordinary healing power of ordinary things. Thank you.